Israel's two and one. They can be beaten. They're vulnerable. There's blood in the water. Right? So the Israel's enemies are emboldened. Commentator Richard Hess points out that any belief in Israelite invincibility, always understood as based upon God's deliverance, evaporated with the sin of Achan. Because of one person's transgression, the occupation of the promised land is delayed indefinitely and many lives are lost in the process. That commentator, Richard Hess, he thinks that AI could have been Israel's last battle if Achan had trusted the Lord. This could have been over before it started. What a great reminder for us that when we give the enemy an opportunity, he gets emboldened. I think of Ephesians 4, 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. Deal with that anger, those addictions, those footholds, so the enemy has nothing to work with. So a massive war is going to happen that didn't need to happen because of one man's sin. Because of Achan's sin. Because of Adam's sin. We're at war. And yet, the big war is not what's going to happen today. We'll look at that next week. But the Israelites, they're going to get attacked today in a way they did not anticipate. That they didn't expect Israel's about to get played. Let's pick things up in verse 3. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse, a trick. These guys live close by, but they pretend to be from far away. They know that Israel's not supposed to make treaties with the Canaanites and because God didn't want them to have any partnership with the evil that the Canaanites were doing. Verse 4, they went on as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. So this is a full theatrical production. All the stops. Verse 6, they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, we have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The Israelites said to the Hivites, but perhaps you live near us. So how can we make a treaty with you? Man, can you imagine the Gibeonites in that moment? Like they're sweating so bad. Is this it? Are we about to get caught? It's over. Verse 8, uh, we, we are your servants, they said to Joshua. So some flattery. But Joshua asked, who are you and where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country, because of the fame of the Lord your God. So again, more flattery, we're your servants, and some good theology too. Your God's the greatest. For we've heard reports of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. Notice they don't mention the victories at Jericho and Ai. They know about them, but they shouldn't if they're from far away. No Facebook back then, right? So, verse 11, and, and the elders and all those living in the country said to us, take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, we're your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you, but see how dry and moldy it is. These wineskins that were filled were new, but look how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. Look at how worn down our hokas are. My translation. <laughs> Verse 14, the Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Uh-oh. <laughs> to quote the Lord of the Rings, but they were, all of them, deceived. Verse 15, Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, Israelites heard they were neighbors living next to them. So the Israelites set out, and on the third day they came to their cities, Gibeon, Kibrath, Biroth, and kiriath Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, We have given them an oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. 
This is what we'll do. We'll let them live, live so that God's wrath will not fall on us by break, for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, why did you deceive us by saying we live a long way from you while you actually live near us? You're now under a curse. You'll never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and wipe out its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that's why we did this. We're now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. Last verse, that day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. This is God's word. So Israel gets deceived by her enemy. The text doesn't really evaluate the Gibeonites. They're kind of like Rahab or maybe you remember Tamar or others in scripture who do shady things for self-preservation. But the real blame here is on Israel for getting played. It's like, yeah, that bread does look really moldy. Those blisters do look pretty brutal. But verse 14, that's the gut punch. The men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not seek the Lord's decision. It literally says, the mouth of Yahweh, they did not ask. They didn't ask God what he thought about the situation. Before Moses died, he warned in Deuteronomy 8.3 that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And it's ironic to me that Israel looks at bread alone. That they make their decision by bread alone, dry and moldy, crumbly bread alone, and not looking to God's mouth. Proverbs 3, 5, and 7, 5 through 7 famously commends the opposite of what they did, that famous verse, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to him and he'll make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. So how do we do that today? Like how do we lean not on our own understanding and submit to him in all of our decisions? Let me just give us a, a quick grid that we could run any decision through. There's of course prayer. So simply asking God for his heart on the situation. And then scripture, like is there any clear scriptural guidelines? on this decision? Then wise counsel, have I consulted godly people about this? Right, not just people who are gonna tell me what I wanna hear. And then of course love, like how is this gonna impact those around me? It's not just about me, right? Then after those big four, then I think like peace, like do we have a subjective sense that, that th a reasonable sense of peace? And then finally, make a decision. If you don't get a clear answer, that's okay. You still sought God. And then make the choice that you feel is best. It's like, I think it was Augustine's famous quote, where he says, love God and do what you want. When we love and seek God, our desires will line up with his. So step forward in faith and courage uh, with God from there. Now, we can't do that with every single decision that we have to make in life, nor were we meant to. But probably the bigger the decision, the bigger the treaty, commitment, consequences, the like greater the need to carefully seek God in those bigger decisions. Joshua and the elders do the opposite of this. And they unintentionally, but still, they disobey God, who said, don't make a treaty with these people. And they do. And there's a sense in which this deception points us back to the first deception in Genesis 3, also involving food, ironically. Look at this bread. Look at this fruit. And use your own eyes to discern what's best. What's best for you? No need to ask God what he thinks. And this has been Satan's number one play from the very beginning. Jesus says in John 8, 44, when Satan lies, he speaks his native language. For he's a liar and the father of lies. 
Sometimes in life we experience Job-like adversity or Jericho-like obstacles. But most of the time, Satan's main play is Gibeon-like deception. Did God really say, God's holding out on you? Our enemy enslaves us by manipulating us with our own desires and fears. How do we know we might be believing a lie? Matt talked about this a little bit last week when he had us stand up, but kind of even before the lie, it might show up, as Pastor John Mark Comer says, as an obsessive thought that keeps coming to mind, or a toxic feeling like shame or worry, a sensation in your body like a tightness of your chest, shallow breathing, or a sense of dread. And there are always lies that lie behind these experiences, these feelings, if we just take a few moments to identify them. Sigmund Freud, who was wrong about many things, but was right about this. Whatever it is about ourselves we deny, we give the most power to. So let's do some examples. If we're anxious about money, we might believe the lies that God is not enough. I don't have enough. I'm not enough. Or we might think, I deserve more. We need that bigger home. Or more money will protect me. If we're harboring resentment, we might believe the lie that I have the right for revenge. They wronged me, the most important person in the universe. They are exclusively defined by what they did to me. If we're agitated about this upcoming election, uh uh-oh, we might believe the lie that this is the most important election ever. If we lose this election, America's finished. It's weird how we hear that every four years. Like, I saw someone trace that language back to 1804. We can stress that an election is important without lying. If we lose, Christianity in America is finished. That's a lie. And I know it's a lie because do you know where the church is thriving right now? Iran. Now, let's say things get so bad that we become Iran. I'm not voting for that, right? Um, I'm not recommending that or rooting for that. But if it does happen, worst case scenario, God is with us and the church endures. I think you should vote. Like, get those ballots in this week. Love your neighbor by voting like God's heart for, to the best of your ability and what, what kind of promotes human flourishing. But don't get played by lies. Turn off the news. Log off Facebook. Seek God in his kingdom. And he'll take care of the rest. But we often don't do this, right? The Israelites didn't do this. We fall for lies. And then when we fall for lies, we have a big mess. So Israel sinned, albeit because they were deceived, but really all sin is deception, isn't it? Overpromising, under-delivering. Like every time I've eaten at KFC. <laughs> every time. Overpromise, underdeliver. So true. (laughs) Sin promises life, but gives death. Every time. That's a deadly lie. So this is a big mess, and the Israelites want to fix it. They want to clean it up, and and they want to do it by killing and driving out the Gibeonites, the original plan. We don't need to honor this agreement, right? It was made under false pretenses. Let's take them out. Have you ever been in a big mess of your making? No need to raise your hand. (laughs) Well, all of our hands would be up, right? And then sometimes when we're in a mess, we make a bigger mess. I had a friend in high school one time who had a few speeding tickets. And when he saw those flashing lights in his rearview mirror that fourth time, he panicked and tried to outrun the police officer. And he got in a pretty bad accident and did a little bit of jail time but it could have been a lot worse. Right, so sometimes we respond to original bad decisions with even worse decisions. Maybe you had a child out of wedlock. 
Maybe you got married to someone and everyone else told you not to marry that person. But now you're married. Maybe you're in a business arrangement that's not going well or you made some other really big mistake or you deeply hurt a loved one. What do we do then? Sometimes we respond to this sin with even more sin. We respond to the original lie with more lies. We respond to evil with evil. And the temptation in the mess is to deny it or downplay it or double down on it or defend it. But the solution is to own it, to take responsibility for it, to honor God through it. To do what you probably should have done the first time. Seek God and his will. And okay, God, what's your will now in this mess, in this new situation? So yeah, love that child with your whole heart. Uh, Do everything you can to make that second marriage work. Honor your commitments. Tell the truth. Make amends. If you can't get out of it, get into it. The Israelites want to break this covenant to make things right, but two wrongs don't make it right. Joshua says, no, we got to honor this covenant. This says something about God and his faithfulness. Many years later, King Saul, in his nationalistic zeal, he loves his country, so he tries to right this wrong. And he tries to kill some Gibeonites, tries to take them out. And years after Saul's death, God holds Israel accountable for Saul's sin. In 2 Samuel 21, and it's a disturbing story. It's a very weird story. Because even though Saul is dead, there are now consequences for his descendants because of his actions. And so two of Saul's sons and five of his grandsons lose their lives because of it. So Saul tries to right a wrong with a wrong, and it just goes so wrong. Responding to evil for evil, mess for mess, insult for insult, bitterness for bitterness, just makes things worse, makes the mess worse, makes us worse. Was it Gandhi who said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind? As followers of Jesus, we don't take revenge, we give up that right. We don't return fire, we absorb it. We don't curse, but we bless. We repay evil, or we don't repay evil for evil. We overcome evil with good, like our Savior did. Maybe you've heard that great prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, Would you read this prayer with me slowly? So, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be comforted as to comfort, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. That's pretty good, isn't it? And yes, you can be an instrument of peace when you were originally the the instrument of the problem. It sounds ironic and it could feel hypocritical even, like because you made the mess or you're partially responsible for the mess, but it can be super meaningful when you become that instrument of peace. To use a really small, seemingly insignificant example, but it's actually really powerful. It's, It's just really profound when parents apologize to their children. Like, I was wrong when I snapped at you back there. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Like, we don't justify it, we don't blame, we don't defend ourselves, right? And that just models to our children so much about repentance and relationships. It was really powerful when I watched my parents do that with me. And if we wrong someone in big ways or in little ways, quickly try and make that right. Because the longer you wait, the harder it gets. It's 10 years later and you haven't talked to them for years. And the longer you wait, the harder it gets. I'm going to invite the worship team back up and let's see how the story ends for Joshua and the Gibeonites. Verse 22, Joshua summoned them and said, why did you deceive us by saying we live a long way from you? 
gospel, you actually live near us. You're not under a curse. You'll never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. So Joshua curses the Gibeonites for their deception. And some think Gibeon was an upper class city, but now they're humbled as servants. So on the one hand, this is not fun. These royal officials are now chopping wood and carrying water for the God of Israel. And at first, everyone around you kind of hates you and wishes you were dead. Maybe like your workplace, I don't know. (laughs) Hopefully not Matt's workplace, right? (laughs) And yet, even in this curse, even in this situation, we start to see a beautiful redemptive arc. Hints that God has a better uh, story, a better plan for even the Gibeonites. Verse 26, this is just kind of, this is really cool. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites and did not kill them. And he made them woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. Joshua, Jesus, same name in Hebrew, saves the Gibeonites. That's kind of cool. This week he saves them from death by Israelite. Next week they're saved from death by Canaanite as they turn on their uh, former comrades. So the Gibeonites might be servants, but they're now God's servants. They belong to him now. They come under his protection. So like Rahab, the Gibeonites make a similar confession of faith. Uh, Your God is the God, capital G. And like Rahab, they escape the destruction of the Canaanites by joining the Israelites. And then think about the work itself that they're doing. They're servants in the sanctuary, carrying uh, water, chopping wood in the place of worship. They're in a situation where they would start to see and learn a lot about the true God of Israel, about worship, about sacrifice. In fact, the Gibeonites keep the place running. They keep the fire burning. Maybe it's like being a janitor at the White House or the Supreme Court or the Library of Congress. Like, it's not your favorite job in the world, maybe, but you get to be in a special place. You you get to be around certain people. There's a prominence of what you're participating in. So the enemy thought, I'm going to use the Gibeonites, their deception and idolatry, to quench Israel's worship. They're pawns in my plan. But God says, nice try, Satan. You're pawns, you're a pawn in my plan. Far from quenching the fire, they're going to fuel the fire of my praise. And the Gibeonites are mine now. They belong to me. Hands off. What the enemy intended for evil, God intended for good. We see this years later in Nehemiah uh, chapters 3 and 7 that, that there are Gibeonites helping rebuild the wall. What does that mean? They are now fully integrated in the people of Israel. So no matter what mess you're in, No matter what you've done or has been done to you, lies you've told or lies you believe, uh, God can turn all that into something good. And there's a place for you with his people. Uh, This is the glory of God. He can't be tricked or outmaneuvered or hindered. No power of hell, no scheme or stupidity of man can ever pluck me from his hand, can ever thwart his epic plan. One of the main storylines of the Bible is that God is committed to working with messed up people. Any messed up people here in this place this morning? And so when we see Gibeonites in our church, when we see former prostitutes like Rahab, when we see messed up people pursuing health and healing, that should rebuke any lie that is self-righteousness. Now there's no sense for superiority. There's no room for superiority in God's family. And there is this sense in which we're all Rahabs, right? We're all Gibeonites. We're all sinners and foreigners who walked into the church with mixed motives. I walked into youth group for the girls, right? But God takes all that, our mixed motives, and and Jesus brings us in. Anyone who believes in him, not just as servants, but as daughters and sons.